Uh, what is this, uh, what is this thing you do? In Cantonese, Jeet Kun Do, the way of the intercepting fist. Intercepting fist, huh? Or foot. Come on, touch me. Any way you can. You see? To reach me, you must move to me. Your attack offers me an opportunity to intercept you. In this case, I'm using my longest weapon, my sidekick, against the nearest target, your kneecap. This can be compared to your left jab in boxing, except it's much more damaging. I see. Well, speaking of a left jab... Oh! This time I intercept your emotional tenseness. You see, from your thought to your fist, how much time was lost. Karate and uh, jiu-jitsu are not the most powerful or the best forms of uh, oriental fighting. What is the most powerful or the best form? Well, <clears throat> it's bad to say the best, but uh, <laughs> in my opinion, I think Kung Fu is pretty good. Would you tell us a little bit about Kung Fu? Well, Kung Fu is originated in China. It is the ancestor of karate and jiu-jitsu. It's more of a complete system and it's more fluid. By that I mean it's more flowing. There is continuity in movement instead of uh, one movement, two movement and then stop. I see. What's the difference between a kung fu punch and a karate punch? Well, a karate punch is like an iron bar. Whack! A kung fu punch is like an iron chain with an iron ball attached to the end and it go whang and it hurt inside. Okay. Li has studied a system of Chinese Kung Fu for the past nine years called Wing Chun and is considered one of the art's most talented and articulate exponents. His teacher in this art has been an elderly Hong Kong Chinese master by the name of Yip Mon. Despite his proficiency in this style of Kung Fu, his study of philosophy has caused him to question. And now he begins to question why most martial artists, Chinese and otherwise, seem more concerned with preserving tradition than with looking more deeply into the matter to penetrate through to the ultimate truth of martial art. Moreover, Li has begun to develop his own method of Kung Fu, which he describes as non-classical in nature and which takes as its core the principles of economy of motion, simplicity, and directness. All right, for instance, you will read it in the book, in the magazine and everything, that when somebody grabs you, you will first do this and then this and then and then and then and then thousands of steps before you do a single thing. Of course, this kind of magazine would uh, teach you to be feared by your enemies and admired by your friends and everything. But uh, in Kung Fu, it always involves a very fast motion. Like, for instance, a guy grabbing your hand. It's not the idea to do so many steps. Step him right on the instep. Feel that go. This is what we mean by simplicity. Same thing in striking and in everything. It has to be based on a very minimum motion so that everything would be directly expressed. Ooh! One motion, and he's gone. Doing it gracefully, not to go, ah, yelling and jumping all over him, but to go, Both the American and Chinese martial art communities resent his iconoclasm. For such a young man to stand up against thousands of years of tradition and venerated authority is considered a direct threat to the status quo and its entrenched power base. Prior to uh, Bruce's coming uh, to this country, uh, you know, the, the Gung Fu was, was alive in most all the Chinese community, but uh, there was nothing taught to outsiders, basically. And Bruce came along, and, and with that basis of uh, trying to create equal, equality amongst all people, regardless of the race, uh, he chose to, you know, to let anybody into his school, regardless of what color or race they were, as long as he knew what was, what was in their heart was good and positive, why he, he took them in, and uh, like when he was down in San Francisco, where the Chinese community was much more uh, uh, like being in uh, China. Uh, they, they, they took exception to it, and he had to fight his way out of it. In Oakland, he received a challenge from the San Francisco Chinese martial arts community, um, and the challenge read that Bruce, if he were to be defeated in this challenge, would have to cease teaching Caucasian or non-Chinese students. And this fight with this Chinese martial artist 
lasted about three minutes. It consisted of a lot of running where the Chinese martial artist took off and started running around the room and Bruce was pursuing him before Bruce finally got a hold of him and took him down to the floor and made him give up. And the, um, after the challenge ended with the Chinese martial artist being soundly defeated and they all went away, Bruce won the right to teach anyone he wanted to. By February 1967, Lee has three schools operating in Seattle, Oakland, and Los Angeles that teach his own interpretation of Kung Fu, based on his own investigations into the ultimate truth of unarmed combat. However, by now, the young man is openly critical of the traditions and limitations he sees as inherent in the martial arts as they're currently being practiced in America. He believes they lack a solid grounding in reality, consisting of rehearsed self-defense routines that are employed in predictable and patternized rhythms. He notes that real combat is spontaneous, not rehearsed, and is made up of irregular or broken rhythm that a martial artist cannot anticipate, only respond to. Even the championship karate tournaments of the era are non-contact affairs, settled not on knockouts, but on an accumulation of points awarded for blows that never touch an opponent. A victory is determined by a team of judges who conclude which combatant would probably have hurt the other combatant the most had contact been allowed. Lee has no use for such styles of pseudo-fighting, which he calls organized despair and dry land swimming. Lee's criticism of the arts can be attributed in part to his background in Hong Kong, which consisted not of non-contact karate tournaments, but full contact street fights and challenge matches fought on Hong Kong rooftops. When not fighting against proponents of different styles of gung fu on rooftops, Lee had also fought frequently against opponents who had been armed with knives and chains. In such real world encounters, referees and judges were not necessary. Rather than participating in non-contact karate tournaments, which he considers little more than glorified games of tagging, Lee instead devotes himself to devising a more scientific approach to unarmed combat. His research leads him to the science of Newtonian physics and the techniques and principles of European fencing and Western boxing, where efficiency, not tradition, are the touchstones of both disciplines. Lee's research causes him to understand that the only litmus test of a combative technique's worth is whether or not it can be landed effectively on an opponent. Anything that's ornamental is discarded from his style. He retains only those techniques that he himself has determined to be practical in real self-defense situations. Lee is the first martial artist in North America, if not the world, to have his students don boxing gloves, headgear, and body protectors and spar all out. Nothing is rehearsed, no punches are pulled, and full contact, reality-based martial art is the order of the day. And he really liked boxing. And at that time, if you can remember that far, people were just doing karate. So it was point karate. And he didn't like that. He thought he enjoyed boxing matches better than karate matches at that time because it was point and it would just take your point and then go back to the corner and then take the point. And he wanted something to flow. So what he did was, because he liked boxing so much, and as you know, he was... Bruce Lee was the boxing champion, high school boxing champion in Hong Kong. He put in the boxing movements of Western boxing, took the kicks from different Chinese systems and southern, both southern and northern systems, and he started to play around with it. In the beginning, we wore a lot of armor, like we wore baseball shin guards, we wore a body protector, we wore face masks, you know, we wore elbow pads, you know, we wore boxing gloves, we experimented with boxing gloves, finger gloves, and nobody was doing it at that time period. The only people that were doing in the United States at that time period would, would probably be Bondo. Bondo is a, a Burmese, uh, Indian, Chinese, and Tibetan martial art. And 
the JKD people in Bondo time, uh, people at that time were the only one that were doing full contact karate. And this is how it evolved, you know. And then later on, we started taking away the shin guards. We started taking away the body protector. We started taking away the face mask. And then we used to, all we used was the uh, boxing headgear. And that became kickboxing. At first, I coined the term Chinese kickboxing. He says, no, just call it Chinese boxing. Because Chinese boxing is what he wanted to be called. And then later on, we start using the word Chinese kickboxing and then kickboxing or John Fon kickboxing. In the development of uh, John Fon kickboxing, Bruce, you research a lot of different systems at that time, the known systems at that time, you would observe them. And the thing he liked about the Muay Thai was the rear leg power. He felt, though, that it, the front leg wasn't active enough at that time period. You have to look at the time period that he, uh, that he was in and why he, was, he made these things. A lot of it came from Don Drager's book. I don't know if you're aware of Don Bra Drager's book. You know? And he classified the ties as saying, well, the uppercut is non-existent. Of course, that's what Bruce Lee did his research. And at that time, a lot of ties didn't uppercut. And the reason why they don't uppercut is because the knee is in the same range. So the knee took care of the uppercut. He says, but he liked the elbows of the ties. He's, he said, well, that's a powerful tool. He didn't, in Don Drager's book, he mentions about the jab was uh, not seen very much, almost non-existent. Okay? And that's the reason why, because they foot jab with their foot. So you have to look at why he came to these, uh, this thinking at that time period. They said the hook was almost non-existent. And the reason why, on the tight hook, the ties use the elbow because the elbow was in range, in tight. They don't have to use the, the overhead because the, the tight hook is in the same range as the elbow. And the elbow will cut the face up more. It will, and it's more punishing than sometimes the left hook. And the kick... He referred to the Thai boxers uh, as the John L. Sullivan with the leg. Now, all this is true depending who you're watching at that time. But if you look at the Thai boxer now, they jab, they cross, they have good hands supplemented with devastating knees, devastating elbows, devastating kicks. So what he was looking at and observing for him and taking his research from him is what Don Drake was saying and what he had seen. He felt that they weren't alive, that they had there was no broken rhythm. But that was true, may have been true maybe in the 60s and in the 70s, but it's not true here in the year, by the coming in 1980, 1990, 2000, because things evolve. The other thing he took from was Savat. Now, many other writings and many of the literature say he did not take from Savat, but I know different. Because I was there when he researched it. I was there when he actually kicked and looked at the super rate of French fighters. If there was a French, I don't know where he even got the tape. There was a French champion on Savat, and he was watching it on super eight and eight millimeter film. And he analyzed it and he said, Oh, I like this. This is a very punishing kick. Coupe de bas, which is the kick when they lift up, you know. He says, This is really good. And he liked the way they use their legs. Because he said, Savat people, or box won't say Savat, they box with the feet. And that's what he liked. And he liked boxing. So he started to put all these elements together. And then he took the kicks, he thought, from northern system and from southern Chinese systems to see how they work. And that became Jun Fan kickboxing. It fit him. For us, we might have to find another path. But for Bruce Lee, that was the path he chose. Elements of... Uh, Thai boxing, elements of Savat, and he liked the headbutts of the Burmese boxers. So he incorporated that into his own personal system. And I don't care what anybody writes about in you know, all the books and all the magazine, he did have those elements in it. Many people don't know. They said, well, he only take a minute from Wing Chun, which is a strong, at that point, had a strong Wing Chun background. But in the kick ranging, he says you don't use that kind of punching. You have to use attack by combination, what he called ABC. Jun Fan is the base system. It has curriculum in it. It has a definite pattern. 
Jeet Kune Do really is the, it, it stems off of Jun Fong Kung Fu. He wanted you to have the base in Jun Fong Kung Fu. And Jeet Kune Do was really Bruce Lee's personal system. And as I tell people before, it can be taught, but you would be losing it if you started to standardize it, because everyone is individual. Things that Bruce Lee did, and this is what people don't realize, what he did, a lot of people can't do. Like he could really shell shock a person with his Lee jab. A lot of people can't not. We could score with that. We could put the guy off balance with it. We might even hurt him, but we can't take a man out. He had tremendous power, and we don't have that, you know. He had speed that it flabbergasted me. You know, I was a conference champion in my college, and he used to catch me like I was just in slow motion. It was like a bad dream. I've never met anybody as explosive as him. I've never met anybody as fast as him. And there will be people that will surpass him, maybe in speed, but maybe in totality, probably not. Because he's a rare individual, and probably when God made him, he threw them all away. Intelligent. A lot of fighters, not intelligent. They're just gutsy. But he was gutsy. You know, uh, he was, he knew the direction in which he wanted to do it purposely. He just knew the direction when he was creating this. And it was created for him. But John Fong Gung Fu, we have to learn how to take the system and make it for ourselves. He didn't really call it kickboxing in the beginning. But he says, we're going to run a kick, and our kicking is going to be like a boxer. At that time, he felt that a lot of systems, they slugged with the foot. He says, you want to fence with your foot. You want to box like with your feet like a boxer. You don't want to use it. So almost 80% of his strikes were with the front leg and the front hand. Because he felt if you were right-handed, that's your most powerful punch. If you're right-legged, that's most powerful kick. And since the left hand was weaker, he would put the left hand back for more power. And because in boxing, he analyzed it that the, that the jab scored so frequently but could not put the person out of commission. It just added, a lot, added up a lot of points. So that's why he put the left hand back for more power, and he felt if he put the strongest hand forward at that time, okay, whether you're right-handed or left-handed, then it's going to be more powerful. And for him, it worked beautifully because he had the power. He worked on it. His three-inch punch was phenomenal. Very few people... Pound for pound, I think he punches. He's like the hardest puncher you would ever meet. You know, he's like a miniature uh, Marciano. He's. We might look at his boxing form, and you'll say, "Well, that's not maybe the most polished boxing form you see." He would be like a, a Marciano, a, a miniature Marciano, or a miniature Frazier. You know, and uh, although he admired Muhammad Ali because he liked the left hand to score frequently. That's why sometimes he would drop his lead. Sometimes people say, no, that's, he's dropping his, um, Muhammad Ali, he dropped his lead. And that's what Bruce Lee did. He dropped his right lead because he said the jab coming up is hard to see. And this is some of the reason why he developed it. And his kicking was like fencing and boxing. He wanted to score frequently and make it very, very sophisticated. And Bruce Lee drew from Western sources. Don't let anyone fool you. It has a Chinese name. But he drew from both East and West, and I know this, although people say in writing, and I don't care how many books are written, they weren't there. They don't know. You know, when we first started off in the trapping, that was emphasized. Like when I started with him in 1964, I started with him right after the first International Karate Championship that Ed Parker threw, and I was a student in a black learner, Ed Parker. I was so fascinated with Bruce Lee. And at that time, he stressed a lot of hand trapping which comes from Wing Chun. And as the years evolve, instead of coming off of a Wing Chun structure, before I used to do a Wing Chun structure and then go into a boxing structure, but as the years evolved, he took the trapping that came off of a kickboxing mode. In other words, a kickboxing mode would be like almost, I would say, savant, kind of a mixture between savant and Muay Thai and northern Chinese systems of kicking with Western boxing. That was the mode. And the trapping came off that. It, it wasn't that the Wing Chun trapping was bad, like the straight blast was good, the trapping was good. It's that he knew there was a time and a place to trap. If you have room, 
you can do the kickboxing. When you're in tight, he felt the trapping was good, and he was very good. And he was very good at what I call first motion. One trap, one hit, he could put you away. Many times I've seen him. He, he's, I think that, uh, I think I'm safe in saying I've been knocked down by Bruce Lee more than any human being on earth. And I know that he could shell shock your body with one shot, one trap, either to the body, to the solar plexus, because he liked me. Of course, he didn't shell shock my face as much, but it was to the body. And when he hit the body, he could knock the wind off. He had that much par, and he had the short range trapping. But that was mixed with Western boxing. In other words, he would come in, trap, go into sort of like Wing Chun hands, and then come out with Western boxing hands, or come out into a, a single leg tackle or a double leg tackle, or a leg pickup, or go to the rear and dump you. In the trapping of Bruce Lee, in the beginning, as I said before, it was mainly Wing Chun trapping. He got out of that a little bit. He, he used to trap, and he would straight blast. And after he would straight blast, he would go to things like overarm hook, underarm hook, body tackle, which is a form of trapping. If you control the shoulder, you control the elbow, that is a form of trapping. So what he did was mix that with the Wing Chun trapping. Uh, probably a uh, person who grapples will look at it and say, well, no, they might not understand the Wing Chun portion. A Wing Chun portion would, can't, would probably not understand uh, why he would go into trapping the arms, trapping the elbow, trapping the head, trapping the body, trapping the legs, okay? What he called hand immobilizing tech, H-I-A. Then there was F-I-A, foot or leg immobilizing because you can grab, you can control the body. A good wrestler will trap the body. He's being trapped on the ground or in the standing position. You can trap and hold. So he liked to go between the Wing Chun trapping and he would go into other areas that he had learned from oh, oh, rest and wrestling that he researched and from maybe observing Sambo. We don't know exactly, and, and I myself, to be really honest, I don't know how he integrated it but I know that it wasn't the regular Wing Chun because when I went back and studied with other Wing Chun people, and that's a great style, Wing Chun. It is a great style. But there's a time and place. Sealot, I know his involvement because he was the first one who bought me all my Sealot books. He used to go to a bookstore and he said, buy that book, that book. He had uh, a great fascination for learning different arts. And with Sealot, he felt a person in Sealot Sealot was a, a tremendous condition. He was a well-conditioned athlete to go through their their uh, forms, what they call kenbango and juros, both the fighting forms and the, and the what we call the artistic forms. He knew that the people and many people uh, say that he never researched that particular art, but I say he did. How much I don't know, but I know that he did research it. He didn't really complete the Wing Chun like the dummy. It was only up to section number seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's why when I learned it, I only learned it up to, the, up to section seven. So he created his own move. He freelance on the dummy. It's not completed. But as a great fighter, he was a great fighter. And he used elements of the Wing Chun. I have an uh, instructor named uh, Sifu Hawkins Chung, who's my Wing Chun instructor. And he said something to me that I thought was very interesting. He said, the first generation of people of Viet Nam were fighters. The second generation were technicians. And the third generation, he felt, they lived off the reputation of the first generation and the second generation. He told me that Bruce Lee's second and third and fourth hand, he could never tell if it was efficient enough. He says, but he knew Bruce Lee's first hand and first motion would blow people away. Therefore, no one knew what his level was in the second and third hand or, or the, the exchange. And I think that's a good thing because, as I remember, Bruce Lee would blow away people on the first strike and on the first hit, which made a difference. I'm sure you can find a lot of great Wing Chun people out there, and as far as knowing the system of Wing Chun, they probably excel over Bruce Lee. You know. But what he did was take the essence of Wing Chun and make it work for you. That's what he says, take the essence. Because some people, let's use it this way so you can understand it, okay? Some people do not have a BA degree. They do not have a BS degree. 
They do not have a master's degree, MA, MS. They don't have a doctor's degree. But even though they don't have the title sometimes of an educated man, they are highly educated. People say, well, he's only, he only has a master's, only, only has a bachelor's. But because if he studied, is so much studying, they have the same caliber of a guy that has a PhD. He, they just didn't have the time to have a, a university or a college recognize the level he was at. Bruce Lee was that kind of type of a martial artist. He's at what I call a P PhD level in understanding it. But maybe sometimes, in other words, for me, sometimes you don't have to be a tenth and a ninth or an eighth or a seventh degree in a particular style of system. You know, maybe you're just a first, but you haven't been recognized or you didn't go through the system to attain that recognition. And Bruce Lee, because he was evolving, constantly evolving, many people from many different systems, black belt and other systems, studied with him or wanted to study with him. Some didn't want to study with him because, you know, it might jeopardize the, their uh, reputation. They didn't want people to know. Others didn't want to do it because they wanted to, but they were embarrassed to train under a person that possibly does not hold rank in any system. Yet you find all these people with ranking following this man, fifth, sixth degree, who befriended him because they knew he had the talent. He knew that he had the knowledge. Bruce Lee used to say, uh, sticking to the nucleus, know the nucleus, follow the nucleus, dissolve the nucleus. In other words, he said, know the principle, follow the principle, and dissolve the principle. This is the way he was. So a lot of times people say, well, how come uh, the stress in Chi Zhao was taken out? It wasn't that he was taken, taken out. It's that he used it to get to a certain level. And by going to that middle level, but he yeah, says, okay. it's not, that's not the whole bag of wax, so as they say. It, because the trapping in the, in the Chi Zhao is one level. Now, when you liberate it and you go at a distance, when a guy is striking and hitting you and double leg tackling and single leg tackling you and grabbing your clothing like a kimono or a gi, it might change the structure. So you've got to know how to use that structure of sensitivity and trapping. But he felt it was important to learn. Not that he didn't think it was important, she's on anymore. He went through it and got that essence so that he could take it and put it in a different structure. So it's important that you can take material out and put it in another material. In other words, let me just put it this way. You know the value of a tank. It will work in certain type of terrains. It will not work in a terrain like the Amazon jungle. Take a tank, it's only stuff because too much vegetation. It will not work in the ocean. It will not work in mountainous region with a lot of trees, but it will work in plains where there's level field. So you got to know the value of that. So like cheese out, it works under a certain environment and structure, and it's a good environment and structure. A good Wing Chun man can make it work in many structures, but for Bruce Lee, it was, he wanted to take the essence of Chi Zhao and put it into his structure. The structure had to be mobile. You have to strike it at different angles. You have to be ready. Because a lot of times the play is up here in the top. The minute the person sinks like a, a single leg tackle, double leg tackle, sometimes now the, the Chi Zhao uh, doesn't have the capacity to deal with it. Now, if it's up here and there's a, it's a crowd of people, right, the, the hand structure, then the Chi Zhao movements will work. You have to know how to use it. It's just like any infantry soldier. There's a time to use the rifle. There's a time to use the handgun. There's a time to use the grenade, the grenade. There's a time to call for the artillery. There's a time to call for an airstrike. There's a time for everything. There's a time to fix bayonets. It's not that 100% you're always going to use your rifle. 100% you're not always going to use a grenade. 100% you're not always going to use fixed bayonets, right? So you have to know how to use it. And a lot of times you have to call for an airstrike for support. So everything has its place. It's neither better nor worse. So cheese out 
is important, I think, you know. And also, uh, just learning how to deal like a wrestler does, plumbing, and moving in for the neck, and arm, like, that's important too, because that's a different type of structure. All structures would be out, to save you to jump in a swimming pool. The kicking is out. The sensitivity is a little bit different now. See, it's different. You see, put two people in five feet of water to five to put people and make them fight in six feet of water. The structure is different. Another type of structure has to come in place. So you have to look at the environment. But I still think it's a practical form. Myself, if I was a person interested in uh, getting better in the martial art, I would study under a good Wing Chun teacher because I do think it's important. I was studying under a, a wrestler because I do believe they're in highly conditioned. They know how to understand sensitivity from another fact. I would study a Filipino martial art and study things like the Hubud, things of that sort, because it's only going to make you well-rounded. The trapping led to the grappling, and I think that's important for people to know that. You know, A lot of people said there was no grappling, and it was true because at that time, they didn't grapple and contest it. They just trapped, straight blast, took the guy down, and then that would be it. We did a lot of things in our own personal training that were not taught in the Chinatown school. And that's because he was experimenting. And that's because he was researching. He loved the research. He loved to experiment. And when he researched and experienced, he would create. And that's why I would say that the curriculum of Jun Fan Gong Fu, which is a set and established system, and Ji Kune Do, which is his own personal system, was constantly evolving because he was constantly evolving. And if you stop, just like in any field of endeavor, there is research, there is experimentation, there is creativity, and there is an evolution that is taking place, a gradual evolution. It's so subtle sometimes you don't even realize that it's evolving. And that's what made him great. When we talk about the grappling in Ji Kune Do, or in Jun Fan Gong Fu, he really didn't teach it at the Chinatown school. And that's because he was still researching it. What he used to do is research on my body. But if I were to organize it, I would say that he, a lot of his finger locking and a lot of his locks came from Professor Wally J. A lot of his takedowns probably came from judo and wrestling because he liked the single leg takedown, he liked the double leg takedown, simple things. He picked a couple of judo throws that he really liked because he had judo training. I don't know how for how long. He liked the Siyonagi. He liked the Kubanagi. He liked the Asotagari. He liked Tai Toshi. Very, very simple, you know. He didn't gravitate to the hip throws like Ogoshi, Yukigoshi, but he liked Uchimata a lot. Right? He liked Tarai Goshi. He liked Hanagoshi. Uh, I would say that I don't know why he didn't uh, incorporate the training, this type of training, but what he did was incorporate it with me. And what we used to do is just go through this movements for, through trapping, through attack by combination, which is more like kickboxing, and then put me in a lock, and we wouldn't contest it. We would just tap. If it hurt, it tapped. We didn't try to get out of it. In other words, we didn't wrestle. However, the newer people now are doing that mainly because of the influence maybe from the movement of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the United States and in shoot wrestling. Shoot wrestling, as you saw, is a combination of Russian Sambo, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and Judo, mixed with European catches can wrestling, mixed in with Muay Thai, and then modified to fit it in what we call kick and punch and submit type of arts. But at that time frame, we did not. That's why I encourage my people to train in a variety of arts because possibly I won't be able to give them in depth that maybe some of these arts can do. And I myself train in these arts because I want to grow also. You know? And I would say that uh, a lot of people were saying, well, uh, the most common uh, comment I hear is, well, Danny Nassano has money the waters of Jeet Kune Do because he teaches other arts. And, but to me... You know, I try to teach Jeet Kune Do and Jun Fan Kung Fu exactly the way Sifu Bruce Lee taught me. However, I love to train in the other arts. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If you like classical music, you should be able to go into pop. You should be able to go into Western music. 
you should be able to go into hip hop or whatever you like. I don't know what you like. And I don't think there's anything wrong in, in liking classical music and pop music or western or jazz or whatever. I think that's, that's a person should be able to do that. But I know I'm criticized for that because people want to just frame me in one particular way. I don't know what the deal is, but I think it's important to grow and you don't grow unless you go out of the confines of security. It's easy to stay in one system and do it exactly that way. It's a little bit more daring and sometimes kind of fearful to go in areas where you're not familiar or to tread on waters that you're not familiar with. But that's where growth comes. As he said, it's from the old that we get the security. It is from the new that we grow. And I think it's important. In any new situation, you're going to grow. In Jeet Kune Do, for an example, there are many camps of Jeet Kune Do. Jeet Kune Do has evolved many different ways depending who's teaching it. And I think that's healthy because everyone's going to develop it and, and bring it up differently. There's a camp that want to teach original Jeet Kune Do material as taught by Bruce Lee. But the point of what I want to say about that is the people that sometimes push that, they don't know the entire original material. And even if they did know the entire original material, to hold it in that frame, time frame, and it's good, and the people should study what was taught at that time period and then expand upon it. If you don't expand upon it, you don't grow. People say, well, that's all I have to know is what Bruce Lee taught me in 1964 or 1967 or 1971. Or that's all I need. I've heard that before from many people. To do that is to go against the philosophy, that, against the concepts that Bruce Lee had and against his principles, because that's not what Bruce Lee is all about. All out combat goes, that's what he says, it utilizes, Jeet Kune Do is supposed to utilize many forms that's why it can fit in with many forms or many methods of systems or styles or whatever you want to call it. You need to to go and be on. In other words, it would be like, okay, I eat Italian food. It's I like it, and it is good, and that's all I'm going to eat. And that's okay, too. But you should maybe eat something else besides Italian food, no matter how good it is. I'm, maybe that's a poor analogy, but I believe that you need to... Uh, you know, be more well-rounded than to stay in that time frame. And if you don't, like a lot of people say, well, let's not, uh, let's not uh, expand this. And then there's people, if you want to, they'll say, I'm, uh, I, I study Aikido, I study uh, Jiu Jitsu, I study Karate, I study a Taekwondo. I'll put it together and I'll call it Jeet Kune Do. Is it Jeet Kune Do? It's Jeet Kune Do for them. But it is not the Jeet Kune Do of Bruce Lee. Because the Jeet Kune Do of Bruce Lee has the Jun Fun Gung Fu material in the beginning. And then from there, they're supposed to grow and expand. That is Jeet Kune Do. And it is different for every individual. So I would say that if you did that, put karate and Aikido and Taekwondo and maybe uh, wrestling, that could be your Jeet Kune Do. That's correct. But it is not the Jeet Kune Do as devised or created by Bruce Lee because he when you say you have the John Fon what he thought were the basics important and then expand and find your own Jeet Kune Do you know Jeet Kune Do I, I really don't know what it's going to be like in the future but I will say this okay, that everyone will promote it advance it in their own way that they think it's right but I will say that Jeet Kune Do people or John Fon Gung Fu Jeet Kune Do people are usually the most free-minded. In other words, what I mean by that is that they are the, usually the first ones will get into any kind of thing that is new. In other words, they were usually the first ones that got into uh, shoot wrestling. They were usually the first ones that got into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. They were the, usually the first one that explored uh, catches can wrestling, Russian Sambo, different things of that nature. So most of them, I say the majority of them, are very open-minded. They're free to go in the path they want. You know, at the time that Bruce Lee uh, was alive, he had uh, three certificates. One was on Jun Fan Gung Fu, and he gave rank one, two, three. That's usually the ranking he gave, reserving eighth as the highest rank. And then he had ranked 
in what he called Chinese Kung Fu, uh, the Tao of Chinese Kung Fu. And then he had rank in what we refer to as Jeet Kune Do. Both the Jeet Kune Do certificate and the Tao of, of Chinese Kung Fu, he gave because it said was personally trained by Bruce Lee. I have three certificates. At the time of his lifetime, I was able to give up to my rank. In other words, I was rank three, I could give rank one. We had two, that was broken down into one and two. And one was broken down into what we call senior one, junior one. Two was broken into a junior one and senior. And I was able to give up to those ranks during his lifetime. You know, the minute he died, people said, no, Bruce Lee didn't give rank. You can't give rank. So, but while he was alive, I could give that. I could test for it if I wanted to, and I could give that rank. So now here in the year 2000, I give rank, and I've added what we call a uh, apprentice instructor. I have added associate instructor and full instructor and senior full instructor. Apprentice now, starting in 1988, the people who study with me, they have to go five years, no matter how good they are, because I think the time with that same knowledge is a difference. They go anywhere from four to five years as an apprentice instructor. This is after they've already gone three years of learning. They have to have a minimum of three years before I can even, even look at them as an apprentice instructor. And they go another four or five years to get an associate instructor. And then they'll go another four and five years to, if they finish what they call a full instructor. And I usually keep four or five years to become senior instructor. People say, wow, that's close to 20 years, 23 years. Because that's the way I wanted. I wanted a high standard, you know. And we all have strengths and weaknesses. And any time you grade somebody, you, it's subjectively and it's objectively. You have to have something objective and you have to have some objective. It's a gut feeling, you know. Yeah. Being a full instructor does not mean necessarily mean you're the best fighter. It means you can lead, you can teach, you know the direction and the way that art should go. And I think that's a very important, you know, uh, nobody expect them to die. And at that time, there was only three of us that were instructors. One was Taki Kimura, which is his friend. And he taught in the Seattle area of Washington. The other one was James Lee, who was his friend also, very dear friend, and he taught in the Oakland area. And the third instructor, I was his third instructor, and I taught in Los Angeles. When I uh, trained under him, we no one knew. So at that time, James Lee, as you know, passed away from cancer. So that left two of us. That was Taki Kamara and myself. I'm very, very close to Taki. I, I had the most utmost respect. He is my senior in Junfang Kung Fu. When he went to Hong Kong, I took over the Los Angeles School. In fact, when it was open, he says, you run it because I don't like to teach. That was his, his saying to me. You teach it. You're the Sifu there. I'll come over to check it out. And that's the way we had it. So when he left from Hong Kong, he says, you are in charge of Ji Kune Do. That's what he said, you are in charge of Jeet Kune Do. And that's pretty hard, because when he passed away, I am not a Bruce Lee, and I'm not going to pretend like I'm a Bruce Lee. I don't have his attributes. You know, I have a lot of his teaching. I was there when he researched on many things, and he researched with different people. If you had a wrestling background, he would play with you and learn what he could from that. So he was constantly learning things also. So I would say that, yes, it is. The burden of Jeet Kune Do is heavy, you know. And... Maybe not one person has the knowledge at all, but I have. A, I feel I have a lot of, of the knowledge that was handed down. I know the direction in which he wanted to. There were people that were students under me that wanted me two types of students. One that wanted to keep it a very closed door group. The other one wanted to expand upon them. There are two different factions here now, striving. One wants to promote it as it big like Taekwondo. The other group does not want. They just want to have three or four or five in the background. And that's the way Bruce Lee wanted it. However, there were many people, illegitimate people in Jeet Kune Do, already saying that Bruce Lee made them instructors and things of that nature. And with this happening, that forced us to come out and start to teach Jeet Kune Do because these people, they weren't even close to what Jeet Kune Do was. Anyway, 
you know, a lot of people would be teaching it, and they would be teaching karate and calling it Jeet Do, and that's all over the United States because no one can check it, right? They don't have belts in Jeet Do. We have uh, ranking, eight ranks, and even that was put away later on, you know. It was important uh, for him to have ranking. So at that time, uh, level three was considered an instructor, Bruce Lee having the highest, which is eighth rank. In other words, there was a yin-yang symbol that was blank, and then each yin-yang symbol had green, brown, black, yellow, and white, red and white, and then the colors of the Jeet And then the last rank, which is his rank, is a blank circle like the beginner. That's the way he had it. So I think he's here to stay. You know, everyone know he is a pioneer in the martial arts. He is, he is like the the Einstein of the martial art because he could do it, he could perform it. You know, he has uh, inspired so many people in the martial arts, not necessarily in Jeet Kune Do. So he's here to stay. He's a milestone. Nothing we can do will diminish it or make it get better. You know. Well, I guess, I guess the last time I saw Bruce was uh, was either at a birthday party, he had returned from California, and he told me about his fight uh, with uh, the Kung Fu Man in, in Oakland, and he told me that that fight had, uh, he had almost been winded at the end of the fight, and that uh, he was now doing a lot of boxing training, a lot of aerobic training, because he realized the importance of those things. Up until that time, uh, most of his fights had, had ended uh, rapidly. Uh, we spent the whole evening of that party in the basement at his mother-in-law's house. Uh, he showed me the new things that he'd come up with, and uh, we spent the whole evening talking. And then, uh, he came to my house one time, that was after Brandon was born, and he brought Brandon uh, to my house and seemed to be pretty proud of, of his kid. Um, you know, when it, uh, Bruce, I think the two things that interested Bruce most were uh, dancing and kung fu. I mean, the, the cha-cha was uh, a very interesting thing for him. And I think if it, if it, uh, yeah, it was a toss-up as to which one was, was more important. Uh, he had a little book of uh, steps and things like that, and he would go to California with uh, another friend of mine who was a student of his, John Jackson, and he would teach uh, Arthur Murray uh, dancers down there for 35 bucks an hour, which in uh, 1960 was uh, a pretty good sum of money. Um, yeah, Bruce loved to dance, and Bruce was a mover. He moved all the time. Uh, he kind of reminded me, I read an article once of Bobby Hull, a Canadian uh, famous hockey player, and how he moved all the time and couldn't sit down and couldn't take vacations. And that was what I thought of Bruce, you know, that Bruce moved all the time. No matter where he was, what he was doing, he was moving some part of his body, training some part of his body, and he just constantly moved. I don't remember the guy's name, but he's into Wing Chun. And he had mentioned that um, he, his belief or his opinion is that Bruce Lee wasn't really good at Wing Chun, but he was a very skillful, not your typical Bruce human being. Bruce was good at Wing Chun. So what's your opinion and what, what do you have to say about that? I don't think my opinion matters, but um, Bruce wasn't good at Wing Chun. People say that because he didn't finish the system, right? So they look at it from an academic point of view, who finished the system. Wing Chun is actually designed backwards. A lot of people don't know that. In a lot of systems, when you start, it's the basic. When you get better, it's advanced. Wing Chun is backward. The best stuff for fighting is Si Wing Tao and Chang As you get better, the advanced form, Biu Yu Ji or Biu Ji, or the Wooden Dummy form, Mok Wing Zhong, is actually backward. It's from when you're losing. 
The wind dummy is really a lot of, a lot of the stuff in the wind dummy form is really about recovering structure when you screw up. The BG form is when you're getting jammed up, getting, getting punched, or you get your arm chopped off, you got one arm left. The third form is actually when you're losing. The best stuff for fighting is in the first and second form. That's not my opinion, that's Wong Shun Lung's opinion. Because in 1995, I met Wong Shun and I asked him these questions. I asked him about Bruce. Wong was the guy that taught Bruce when Bruce was a kid in Hong Kong. He told me Bruce had really good Wing Chun, that Bruce was a really good fighter. And this is from a guy, the, probably the best Wing Chun fighter that ever lived out of Hong Kong, right? Had dozens of challenge matches, not Master Wong Shun Lung, right? Had street encounters. There's actually a documentary of him coming out. He was the real deal. Better than a lot of people shit talking on the internet. And Wong Shun himself said Bruce was really good. He said Bruce's level of Kung Fu, not many people can play at that level. And uh, besides teaching Bruce when he was a kid, he also sparred with Bruce at the end of Bruce's life. So he had a full picture. And according to a person that was there when Wong Shun and Bruce were sparring at the end, Bruce more than hold his own, right? So that's from a fighting perspective when he said Bruce had pretty good Kung Fu. Good Kung Fu. On top of that, he also said outside of Hong Kong, there's not that many good Wing Chun. Most Wing Chun is shit. That's his opinion, not mine, but that's what he said. So how can you say Bruce's Wing Chun is not that good, right? When Bruce went to Seattle, they said he didn't finish the system. What people don't realize, Bruce made a lot of modification to his Wing Chun, right? He added a lot of pressure, educated pressure, right? He added the back fist, he changed it. the hand positions of the hands, right? And he learned from Master Fook Yen. Fook Yen was a Red Bull Wing Chun master. And if you look at all lineages across the globe in Wing Chun, they can all trace the root back to Red Bull. That's the original Red Wing Chun system, right? All Wing Chun came from Red Bull, right? So Bruce had training with that. From 1959 to 1965, he trained with Master Fook Yen. So how can you say that he didn't know it was Wing Chun? What is he talking about, right? And, words aside, Bruce taught his Wing Chun, his non-classical Wing Chun, to a man named Jesse Glover, his first student. Jesse went around the world, and he had a good chance to cross hands with one of Wing Chun guys. In all the years that Jesse did that, he never got touched once. And he was able to hit people at will. So when people said Bruce's stuff wasn't that good, they can say that all they want. But it didn't stop people from getting hit. If they were right, then how come they couldn't touch Jesse and Jesse was hitting them at will? So yeah, so you, it doesn't matter if people think Bruce was the best man, I don't care about that. But to say he didn't know Wing Chun at all, that he wasn't good, he was just an actor, he was just a guy in good shape, are you kidding me? Come on, man. You talk to Wong, Wong is the best Wing Chun guy, and he said Bruce's Wing Chun was good, really good. His fighting ability was really good, and other people, most Wing Chun guys were shit. That's what he said, right? What's more important is, when you start saying Wing Chun is better than JKD or Bruce or Bruce is better than Wing Chun, you're missing the point of martial arts. The whole point is to learn what you can from everybody. Keep an open mind, stay humble, show respect, learn from a Wing Chun guy. Learn what you can from Bruce. But to sit there and then start like trash talking someone that's already dead, that made a big contribution to martial art, without doing research to know what he actually did. So that's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. One other question though, uh, in it he mentioned that Bruce was good with the first punch, yeah. but couldn't come up with the second or third because of always being so, I, I, I didn't quite understand it clearly, understand. but he was saying like, you know, he could take you on one shot, mm -hmm. but, because he was talking about Chisa, and he was kind of talking about the movement and the follow through, so you counter one, you counter two, you keep flowing, and he said that Bruce Lee never had to worry about that so he never trained that it is true that bruce didn't have to worry about that because according to the guys that was there and i'm gonna sidetrack a little bit this guy i know who i'm talking about and a lot of guys say the same thing that bruce was an actor he couldn't fight right that's because they're looking at bruce's demonstration and looking at his movies and looking at the crap he did in his movies and his demonstrations they said and then they said this guy can't fight you can't judge a guy based on what he does in the movies anyone that's been on a movie set no you have to do crap to sell the movie you think that's what he did in a real fight? It's not the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, they say he couldn't fight because he was a small guy, but his first student, Jesse Glover, was way bigger than him, way stronger than him, and was a judo champion. It wasn't an average guy, it was a champion, right? You look at his second student, Ed Hart, was 240 pounds, six foot three, professional boxer, not amateur, professional boxer. 
Both of them, I studied with them briefly, and they both told me they couldn't do shit against Bruce when they first met. When Bruce moved in, bang, it was over. So you're telling me the guy can't fight? I don't know how good of a fighter he was, but they tell me he couldn't fight at all? Come on, right? Now, they both said the same thing of what you just said, that when Bruce made his first move, he didn't have to do his second, third, fourth move because people couldn't even respond to his first move. That's how fast he was. His timing was phenomenal. His speed was phenomenal. So he didn't need to go and use his backup system, so to speak. He just bang, he hits you. He couldn't respond to the first movement. So the guy's right. But just because he didn't need to doesn't mean he couldn't. There's a big difference. He was fast enough to hit you before he can do anything. But if you stop him, he has a lot of pressure, a lot of sticking in his system as a backup system. So how did, the, how did he know that Bruce didn't have a backup system? How can he say that Bruce couldn't stick? Did he stick with him before? Did he stick with any of Bruce's students before? I have, and I couldn't do nothing against him. I was like, nothing. When I stick with Jesse, holy shit. And I stuck with a lot of Wing Chun guys. So, to say that Bruce can stick, and like I said, he studied with Master Fook Yin, right? That guy was one of the best Kung Fu guys that ever lived in the Seattle area. So why don't people do some research before they say that? If you judge people, and he's talking a lot of shit about JKD, looking around the JKD world and saying, look, these guys can't do this, these guys can't do that. Well, you can't judge what Bruce was doing or what he wasn't doing based on what his students are or his grand students are doing. That's not on Bruce. Why is that on Bruce? Everyone's different. His stuff got so spread out and commercialized, of course it's not, a lot of times it doesn't resemble what Bruce was up to. Right? But just stop talking shit up with the guy because you don't know the guy. Right? Do your research before you say something. Right? And stop talking about disrespecting people, the pioneers that made martial arts so good. He made so much contribution. Why can't he be a little grateful? Right? So, what other questions do you have? <laughs> I guess, in general terms, like what Chi Sao. What about Chi Sao? What is Chi Sao in essence? Because it seems like it's a training method to. It is a training method. She said it's a training method, it's a backup system. You attack somebody, something gets in your way, there's pressure, right? If you're gonna have to think about it, it's too late, so you, you respond to pressure. That is sticky. You know, baby, this bamboo is longer, more flexible, and very much alive. And when your flashy routine cannot keep up with the speed and elusiveness of this thing here, all I can say is that you will be in deep trouble. That we will have to find out. I'm telling you, it's difficult to have a rehearsed routine to fit in with broken rhythm. You see, rehearsed routines lack the flexibility to adapt.
Thank you.